Radio Deplorable is part of the Ricochet Audio Network run by Ricochet.com. Here's why you should join the Ricochet community. You can write your own post or comment on thousands of other posts on every conceivable topic. Connect with conservatives from across the country and around the world. Ricochet is the home of smart and civil conversation on the web. Join or create your own Ricochet group and interact with others who have the same hobbies, interests, and pursuits. Check it out at Ricochet.com slash join. Membership starts at just $2.50 a month and you'll be supporting podcasts like this one. Go to ricochet.com slash join right now and join the conversation. Finally, it's Radio Deport. With Dave Carver, that pole of the highways, that cruise to the Peter Post, that Hemingway of the highway. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Carver. He's the host of one of the best podcasts in the country, an occasional contributor over at Fox News, Fox Business Network. He's been published in the Washington Post, Huffington Post, Money Matters, and has done numerous radio interviews across the country. But most importantly, in my book, He's truly one of the good guys and a friend of this program. Dave Sussman joins Radio Deplorable straight ahead. I'm Dave Carter, and uh, for, the, for the uninitiated, I'm a retired military veteran with three combat tours in the Mideast, a senior military historian, and the author of over 40 volumes of military history. And if that wasn't enough, I'm also a former cross-country truck driver with over a million miles, Lord across America, and uh, yeah, I'm a former private detective and radio show host, which means, in other words, I really can't hold a job for very long. But these days, I'm having a grand time writing for Ricochet and hosting such luminaries as Dave Sussman here on Radio Deplorable. Dave has not only done all the stuff I listed at the outset, uh, he's also the purveyor of Whiskey Politics website and podcast. And he's interviewed some of the most interesting and some of the smartest folks to be found anywhere, including Professor Victor Davis Hanson, who's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute, Charlie Kirk, who is the founder of Turning Point USA, George Gilder, Gilder, yes, a prolific author, economist and investor, and tons more. I've often referred to Dave in the past, lovingly, of course, as the Where's Waldo of the conservative movement because of his amazing knack of interviewing the right people behind any given issue at exactly the right moment in time. And it's a pleasure to welcome Dave Sussman to the program again. Good evening, Dave. Well, I'm done after that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm cashing in my chips, man. I'm going uh, home. Uh, see, you just, we just won. Well, and thank you for listening to Radio Deplorable. We'll be with you next time. And uh, man, It's good to see you. How you been? It's good to see you too, man. I, I first of all, doctor, we're missing yes. our friend, Doctor Diebel. So yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> he was on a few weeks ago, and I called him in between cruises I heard or something. That. He's he's so good. He's so good, and uh, he's he's a good friend, and it's great to hear him doing well wherever he is in Poland or overseas on some cruise somewhere. I don't know. Uh, who knows? I, I I live vicariously through his various posts on social media, basically. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, he's he's got the gift of the quip, you right. know. Right. Well, yeah. Uh, I I I just have a stream of consciousness, and nobody <laughs> wants to listen to it. But uh, people says something, and it gets everybody laughing. Well, so, we're, we're gonna... and you, and it's great to have you back on. I know that you took a little bit of time off, Dave. What uh, where what happened? I know you've been busy with things, but well, uh, we missed you. Yeah, I took about oh uh, six seven months hiatus. Uh, Part of it was I just got bogged down. I've been writing and uh, commenting on uh, current events for, geez, 34, 35 years now. And after a while, I was, I, the, uh, the venom at times was just a bit much. And I found myself too tempted to become totally absorbed in it. And when that happens, you tend to lose yourself. You're so immersed in the latest controversy that you kind of lose perspective on things of uh, eternal importance. And so I thought this is a good time to just take a little break, step back, recoup, regenerate, rest up, and uh, recapture some of that perspective. And also, a couple of years ago, I had a back injury, and it flared up again, too. So I was kind of on meds for a couple of months trying to get get back to, you know, back into fighting shape from that. It's kind of frustrating because I was doing really well in the gym up until that point, and now I'm back to 
<laughs> square one again, but I guess the way it goes. Yeah, well, it's what happens when you turn 40 again. You know? 40? I, I, I made a joke. I posted something on Twitter earlier today. You know, the, the, apparently Rambo is now coming out with First Blood, The Last Blood, or something like this. Like, basically, it's the end of Transfusion the Transfusion of Blood. blood. And I and I and you see this preview of this of, of this pre um I don't know how Sylvester Stallone is. How old do you think he is? Probably in his late sixties at this point. At but least, uh yeah. I said I I I I broke a hip just watching the preview. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well you said forty. I've got socks that are forty, so I mean, you know, come right. on. Oh man. <laughs> we don't talk about our age no, anymore. No, no. Yeah. But it's just yeah. it's good to be back and it's good to be back podcasting. And thank you again for for uh, taking the time to joke around with us and, and we'll chat a little bit um of with, course. with your permission or maybe entirely without it uh what i'd like to do is interview the interviewer so i won't ask you to name your favorite guest because that's not really a fair question which of course is why it immediately sprang to mind uh so what i'll do in a moment is i'll tick through uh, down a list of some of the interviews that you've done and ask some questions about a few of them but first as someone who's done a few interviews myself um there are some moments across the spectrum you're taking the the view from 30,000 feet. There are some moments in interviews that stand out uh, where I learned something that I really didn't see coming or something in the demeanor or response of the guest uh, really took me back a little. I'm wondering if you've had any comparable experiences where there, there may have been a pleasant surprise or illuminating moment in the exchange that caused you to do some kind of a double take. Um, does anything of that nature happen to you so far? There's actually an interview that's about to be coming out. And so nobody's had a chance to hear it yet. Mm -hmm. And this is definitely a, an interview um, that I think will will uh, suffice for your question. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I have a good friend. He's got a new platform coming out, which I'm hoping to be a part of in the next few months. And um, he's got a good friend by the name of Don Blankenship. And Don Blankenship, for, for our listeners, he probably recognized the name. He was the former CEO of Massey Energy, which was a huge coal mining company. They had hundreds of mines. And um, he uh, uh, got into it with the unions back in the 80s and the 90s, made a lot of en enemies, including uh, I think it's Richard Trumka. Uh, anyway, the, the, the guy that ran the <clears throat> AFL-CIO, he, right. he was one of the top number one guys in the Obama White House. And um, he was running Massey Energy, and um, the Obama administration came in and started regulating his mines to the point where they were trying to close them down. They were doing stupid things. Um, uh, the the, the, the uh, mining safety MSHA, uh, the Mining Safety uh, Hazard Administration or Health Administration, mm -hmm. literally stopped them from having airflow in the mines. And the engineers uh, at Massey Energy said to them, hey, you guys can't do this. We're going to end up with explosions. And the day after they implemented one of these MSHA requirements pushed down by the Labor Department under the Obama administration, there was an explosion. Twenty nine miners died. Okay. Now, you probably remember this. In the I, news I do. Because, I didn't know that was those two th items were connected, though. So um, Don Blankenship, the CEO, dealing with just being horrified and mortified, he's now got 29 families in a West Virginia town, the upper big branch mining town, mm -hmm. uh, had to deal with this. And then they went after him and filed four indictments, criminal, OK, felony indictments against him personally. And he spent the next several years fighting it. Um, he ended up serving time in jail for a misdemeanor. They got rid of the four felony indictments. And during his time in jail in Taft, California, he spent a year in jail for for a crime that nobody has ever gone to jail before. A misdemeanor served a time in jail, politically motivated. Gracious. He decided that he was going to come out and run against uh, the uh, st senator from the state of West Virginia, Joe Manchin. When we remember that campaign, this was the birth of cocaine Mitch. Right. Anybody that knows the term cocaine Mitch that doesn't know where it came from, it was uh, Don Blankenship. And he pushed this out there and it got uh, – he, he, he ran one of the worst campaigns I've ever seen. Whoever was his campaign guy uh, should have been fired. But he stood up there and he talked about Chinaman. And he talked about cocaine, Mitch. And boy, did the late night 
uh, comedians, quote unquote, because no. I don't find them funny anymore. Right, right. Uh, take him to 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 the woodshed, and um, and and so if you watch, uh, if you if you type in Don Blankenship on YouTube, you'll find John Oliver from U- uh, from um, HBO, and uh, and it's it, it, they really went after him, and this is all I knew about Don Blankenship okay. was what I heard in the media, right. and the guy wasn't a good guy, mm-hmm. but I went out, they flew me out to Vegas. And um, I sat with him for three hours. We did a two and a half hour interview. So this is by far the longest interview we've mm. done. We're going to break it up in three different episodes for America's Voice News. Right. But we're going to put it up there in whole. And listen, Joe Rogan does them every day. So, I don't, you know, it's not a big deal. Yeah. But um, I went in there. I think the word that I want to use is reserved. Mm-hmm. Because everything that I learned about this guy was that he just wasn't a really nice guy. And we went from his childhood all the way through serving jail time to running in the campaign to where he is right now. And I walked out of there with a different perspective that I didn't know before. And I was really taken back. Um, and I think it's a really important interview for people to to watch and listen to. Not so much that it's important because we talk about obstruction and collusion and how the Obama administration wanted to close down the mining industry and how they mm-hmm. use the agencies to do this and they put right. people in jail and everything else. That together is, 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 is really interesting. But how my belief as somebody that I think, like you, Dave, is very open-minded – and I always believe there's two sides to every coin, and right. I don't believe much of what I get from the media. How I personally had an opinion about this guy, where I walked away from that interview going, holy cow, I, I, I knew none of that. So that's coming up real soon. So your your listeners, hopefully they'll they'll take a listen to that or watch no it. No kidding. I certainly will. I'll, I'll, I'll be linking to that myself. That's interesting. So I mean, he, he came across as absolutely, uh, for lack of a better word, legit, right? It wasn't a... Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a snow job. Um, I asked him some pretty tough questions and I did my Barbara. Listen, at the end of two and a half hours, I asked him any regrets. Would you would you regret going after Mitch McConnell, cocaine Mm. Mitch? I think that was not not necessary. Right. You could see him cracking a little bit and then he kind of came back around a little. uh, But I I think um, I I think the guy's got a ton of money. You should have seen this house in Las Vegas, Mm. 40 foot ceilings we were under. Uh, he's, he's, he's in a very good position financially, but, um, you know, he's writing a book about this, but I think that it's, it's really important for all of us that want to, you know, see how the government can be used to take out somebody, the power that they have, even somebody as powerful as this guy, um, you know, running the sixth largest mining company in America, North America, um, you know, they got him. Well, if they can, uh, if they can go after someone like him that has, I would imagine the resources uh, to, to help himself or to help out to defend himself, at least uh, legally. What can they do to a poor schmuck who doesn't have anything like that? You know, or or, or organizations that right. are running conservative, uh, right. like uh, you know the Tea Party, and they're going to use the IRS, or whatever it that. may be. Yeah, exactly. Uh, switch switch gears for just a moment. There's an interview that you did uh, that really stands out in my mind, and that was just a few months ago when you were a guest in the home of uh, Professor Victor Davis Hanson. Yeah, and yeah. He, he gave us a bit of history of the homestead there, and mentioned all the generations of his family who have lived on the property and in the house. And I was struck by the changes that he described that have happened in the surrounding property, where at one time it was a uh, a conglomeration, I guess you could say, of all sorts of uh, families, backgrounds, very diverse community there. And now, beyond the walls of his property, there's just open land. From what I gathered, it must have been amazing to stand there and take all that in and as he explained it to you. Yeah, it was. If you watch the, the uh, video, there's a couple of snippets where we're walking around outside. And unfortunately, he's he's uh, he's got a very modest home um, mm. and but it's walled in. Yeah. So you're standing there watching us in front of a couple of cinder block walls. It's not very yeah. interesting. <laughs> so we try to we try we try to um, put in some of the pictures that we got from his almond ranch, which goes on for miles. And this whole area is agricultural is, is agricultural corporations now. Right. I yeah. mean, they basically run by farm agriculture, you know, conglomerates. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, you know, he was telling he was telling us that, uh, you know, his family uh, has been there for many, many years and he's passing on the legacy, he hopes, uh, you know, and and uh, he's got people still working the farms. But there is a multicultural aspect to this area. Right. 
in the middle of central California, which for uh, out people outside of California, this is the red part of California. This is red state California, and people okay. may be scratching their heads. But I didn't know such a thing get, existed anymore. You, yeah, you, you go inland 25, 30 miles away from the coasts, mm -hmm. and it's there's a lot more conservatives than people okay. would think. <clears throat> Unfortunately, yeah. the, the tech titans in Silicon Valley and the Hollywood studios, you know, they carry the uh, power. Yeah. But um, Red State, California is where Victor Davis Hansen lives, and he was very gracious. He showed us the, uh, the home and uh, what is going on outside and, and how it's changing. Um, dramatically changing, and the illegal alien population. Can I say that still illegal aliens, I don't undocumented see why not. workers? I do. Jay Leno uh, called how it's, them it's changing as well, and um, you know it's changing the state in California with sanctuary state laws, right. and it's changing the educational system. And uh, just today, in the last couple of days, I think it was uh, Gavin Newsom said that he wants to spend, uh, you know, like a hundred million dollars. The state assembly wants to spend a couple of billion dollars on providing health care for illegal immigrants. So. Uh, you know, no. OK, <laughs> that's great. Meanwhile, my my twelve hundred dollar a month insurance, which has doubled in the past five, six years, you know, that still has to be paid to somebody. Right. Yeah. Um, I, during the course of the interview, I, I was back to the Victor Davis Hanson interview. I was practically mesmerized by his innate ability to take current uh, events, current situations and view them through the lens of history. Uh, ancient mm -hmm. history at times, too. You guys covered a lot of topics uh, from the hard left turn that the progressive movement is taking to the resurgence of anti-Semitism on the left. Uh, was there a particular moment or topic that really stood out to you during the interview? I know it's kind of like asking you to choose which priceless diamond in a whole array of them that you liked the most, but was there something that, that really stood out? Uh, so this is just between you and me, right, Dave? Sure, of course. Nobody's listening. Uh, okay. This was this was on the heels of what was happening with between him and the Bulwark. Okay. Uh, if you're familiar with the Bulwark publication, it's a, a nascent uh, publication started up uh, by Bill Kristol, yep. never Trumper. Yeah. And there was some serious infighting, um, or I should say, it's public fighting on Twitter that was going back and forth. I remember. Uh, and um, and so when we talked about that, my my primary question to him, as somebody like myself who has respected the um, the service and the honor of, of John McCain. I'm not somebody to badmouth John McCain personally as a, a, in his service, and I, and I take my hat off to him. Uh, but what had happened in the past couple of years before John McCain's passing and how it led into um, – uh, or the waters being carried by folks like – Bill Crystal or Charlie Sykes or other folks, which share your platform, our yeah. platform on Ricochet as well. Mm -hmm. I don't have a I don't have a bad word to say about them personally. I've met Bill Crystal; he's a good family man. But um, how they have basically taken their energy and focused it inwardly towards the conservative movement and alienating uh, most conservative voters today, who mm -hmm. may not, whether or not you like the man himself, Trump, you as a conservative can't help but applaud a lot of the policies. Right. There's no perfection in anywhere. And so my question of him, which I thought was fascinating, was what happened? Why, why is somebody like a Bill Crystal, who was the chief of, chief of staff for um, Dan Quayle and has been a, an icon as, far, as long as I can remember, right. 30 years, uh, how him and Jennifer Rubin and others like them are focusing the ire towards you and I? And there are so many more fights in the cultural war. There are so many fights in the economic and the and the uh, international wars of of dealing with Iran and North yeah. Korea and the things that we should be fighting for. And so I thought he was extremely um, transparent. You could see that he was angry. We we had words off of camera, which yeah. which weren't on there as well, yeah. because again, this was relatively fresh, and you could see that he was really upset by this. And he took to his pen and he wrote about it in articles and, uh, you know, and, and the bottom line is that and he he referred to you talk about history. He referred in his book, The Case for Trump, to a lot of the movies of the 1950s like Shane. And he referred to and you probably saw this if you watch the video. He referred to uh, Donald Trump as a as a drawing danger field in Caddyshack. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yes. the guy that's very not welcome in the country club. Right. Although this guy owns the country club. Um <laughs> But but does that mean that you that you you 
you don't stand up and applaud when he does the right thing. And I think that's where the uh, uh, the disparity is between a lot of people on his Never Trump, and I think they're small, relatively small right. movement today, right. um, and folks like us who are just general run of the mill conservatives that just want low taxes, free markets, low regulation. Put you know put somebody at the border to stop people running in, and uh, let's figure out how we can uh, decrease the size of government. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that 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 were things that I thought that we had previously been all united on, and it's unfortunate that it almost seems that those things are now denigrated for the sake of taking pot shots at the man that's implementing this stuff, or at least trying to. Um, to, to go briefly to something I mentioned in the previous question, uh, the subject of the increasing anti-Semitism on the left is one that worries a great many people in the subject that you've discussed with several of your guests including uh, author Rabbi, is it Shmuley? Do I have that right? Shmuley? Yeah, Rabbi Shmuley. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, former Israeli ambassador Dora Gold. Uh, when you look at these folks and others uh, and we'll see what they have to say on the latest groundswell of anti-Semitism, do you see a common thread or a, uh, a consistent diagnosis, if you will, of the causes of this nonsense and uh, on the part of those who love to extol the virtues of diversity all the time? Yeah. Well, uh, just as a caveat before we start, I am Jewish. I am the grandson of a um, a prisoner of war of Nazi-occupied France. My grandfather fought in the Royal Air Force and was shot down over France in uh, World War II. And my wow. father was a, a, a poverty-stricken East Ender that basically had to fight every single day because he was Jewish. And so I was born and raised with the identification of being Jewish. I'm sure. not the most religious Jew. I'm not Orthodox, but I'm a conservative mm-hmm. Jew. Sure. And, uh, and I've raised my two sons to be Jewish. And, um, and so it's important to me that uh, what we're seeing happening right now is um, something that I think is terrifying, and it is not carrying the weight in the United States that it should. It certainly is getting a lot of uh, conservative folks, and, and many of them, unfortunately, uh, and it's fortunately and unfortunately, mm-hmm. are Christian. And when I say fortunately, thank you, Christians. So they, they believe in Israel, and they believe in the Jewish people. Thank you. No. Unfortunately, there should be more Jews standing up. And and then the unfortunate part is that 70 percent of Jews will vote for the Democratic candidate. That's always perplexed and, me. And it, it's it, it's incredible to me. But what what I what I'm seeing right now is that, listen, there is absolutely you can go through your history. There is no doubt that the hard left has a history of anti-Semitism. It, it's it's deep and it's enduring as as the hard right. OK, mm. and so everybody wants to talk about, you know, the the the, the Ku Klux Klan or the uh, white supremacist movement. And those are far, far extreme. Yeah. But what isn't extreme today is the hard left's anti-Semitism. And, you know, we will hear, oh, no, 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 no. It's different. We don't hate Jews. Dave, we only hate the nation state of Israel that is keeping Palestinians under the thumb of these uh, the right wing Netanyahu government. Yeah. OK, it's absolutely ludicrous. If, if anybody hasn't been to Israel, they can't stand up and say that. Because if you go to Israel, you know, and you and I talked about this a few years ago, in fact. I went to Israel a few years ago, and I came back, and you you wanted to talk to me about this. You'll see Arabs working in Israel that are absolutely 100% pleased. They love Israel. Why? Because if they step outside the free free country, Mm -hmm. the democracy of Israel— They'll be under the thumb of Sharia law. If you're homosexual, as you know, you're going to be thrown off roofs in Iran. Yeah. Okay? And if, if you want health care in Israel, you are not looked at, whether you are Muslim or Christian or Jewish, they don't look at your religion. They will take care of you, and they will educate you. And so what we're seeing right now is these most strident anti-quote-unquote Zionists mm-hmm. that are coming out of the woodworks, many of them are Jews, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm I'm blanking That's right okay. now. The the, <clears throat> the attorney, uh, Alan Dershowitz. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, Alan Dershowitz wrote a a, a, a wonderful article today. It's it's uh, you can find it on the Gatestone Institute, okay. GatestoneInstitute.org, and he says it's not surprising to see an increase in Jew hatred in Western Europe. He goes into the historical reasons why, and. 
you know, he talks about, wait a minute, had the Palestinians were oppressed by Egypt and they were oppressed by Jordan and Gaza was an open air prison between 1948 and 1967 when Egypt was occupying power. They are an open air prison right now under Hamas. Mm-hmm. And, and Dershowitz goes into the history of it. But if you take a look at it today, OK, where is um, Rashid Tlaib? Where is Ilhan Omar? Where is AOC coming out and standing up against against Hamas? Be- and, and they will say, well, it's it's a democracy. They voted for Hamas. No, they don't. It's like a democracy like North Korea is a democracy. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely insane to me. And and so um, I'm deeply, deeply concerned. You're now no longer – they're recommending you, if you live in, in Germany, to no longer wear a kippah, a kippah on your hat, mm-hmm. your head. Okay. Okay? Wow. Because it's too dangerous. Germany. It's, Germany. It's I mean, the dangerous. irony is not lost here. Germany. In Germany. Yeah. Okay, this is Western Europe. Right. Now, Germany, you know, <laughs> I've been to Germany – They've had a couple of problems in the past century, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, a little bit. I don't see, I don't see them going in that direction again. But there's yeah. certainly a, 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 uh, an element in Germany, but it isn't the element that you and I think of when we think of Germany. Okay. That element isn't the brown shirts. Are there some white supremacists still in Germany? Absolutely, just like there are in America. Yeah. Small, forget about it. You know who the unit should be concerned about right now? The Islamists, not not Muslim, you know, people living and trying to assimilate mm-hmm. the Islamists. The militants. And this is due to multiculturalism that has started 20 years ago. And, uh, you know, uh, Merkel has even admitted to it. It's a miserable failure. And it's now causing so many problems where Jews that just want to live their lives like you and I want to live our lives right. are now being recommended that you can no longer uh, display your religion. This is getting really, really scary. Um, during the course of, of your interview with Rabbi Shmuley, I believe you guys talked about uh, what, he, what he quoted, that God is dead in Europe. What, what was that about? Yeah, that surprised me. So Rabbi Shmuley is considered America's rabbi. He is mm-hmm. all over the place. He's a fantastic writer. He's written 31 books. He's all over news. Um, he actually, and, and he is definitely conservative in his politics, but he's actually friends with Cory Booker. They okay. they work together and, mm-hmm. and, and taught, to, and, and uh, I think in Cambridge, or was it Oxford? Anyway, one of the two Ivies in, in, yeah. in England. Uh, I think it was Oxford, actually. Uh, anyway, um, so... He said uh, that we talk about um, Western Europe and the level of anti-Semitism, but a lot of the fact that, going back to my original point, that 70% of American Jews will vote for the Democrat no matter what, Mm -hmm. even with a Rashid Tlaib and an Ilhan Omar in the midst. And I asked him why, and he says, because 6%, 6% of Europe now goes to church or synagogue on a regular basis. That's it. Six. Yeah. Not 60, not 16, six. 94% of people don't go to church or synagogue on a regular basis. And so the new religion is secularism, which has to be filled in somewhere. Void is filled in like that, and we find it in places like environmentalism or uh, addiction or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Okay? But so when a rabbi a devout rabbi, an orthodox rabbi, one of the world's leading rabbis, says that God is dead in Western Europe. That should be a wake-up yeah, call to everybody. Really. Particularly if we're going to, if we have so many people in this country that are trying to follow Europe's lead, for lack of a better word to use that. Well, yeah. we want us to become I don't more know. European. I, that's know, not a, but, that's but not a good what, way to what go. What are we seeing in Europe happening right now? Right. The, the 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 election results. Everybody's going away from. Uh, everybody's going away from the globalist mentality. Everybody wants to go towards a Brexit type ideal here. You remember? Uh, I mean, if you good sorry France, Italy, uh, England, all just in the last week. Right. Yeah. I think, and, and, and so if somebody stands up and says, oh, this, this thing with Trump in 2016 and Brexit in 2016, that was an anomaly. Uh, no, people, people are furious. There, there is a division right now. We don't want the elites, 
uh, feather, you know, uh, just just putting money into their own pockets and giving us lip service as they've done for 30 years. And, and we're now seeing it happening all across Europe. And as, as Mark Stein said, uh, uh, really, he was dead on with this. He said it's much easier for the public to find the new elite than it is for the elite to find the new public. And that's what we're, that's what we're learning with, with the election of Trump. And uh, some of these other folks in Europe that are sent packing because the people just don't want this. So they'll find the different elite and let the quote unquote elite find themselves a new public. We had Nigel Farage on the show a few months back Mm -hmm. and uh, he I I was asking him point blank. I said, Brexit is dead. Theresa May is deeply unpopular. What are you going to do? He says, we're working on it. We're going to we're going to come out. We're going to start a new party. We're going to we're going to win this thing. This was two months ago, Dave. Yeah. And look what just happened. The right. Brexit party right. won everywhere. Most of London as well, even though London didn't win. It was like a 52-48. Hmm. So even even in deepest of deep blue London, that's like Los Angeles or New York going 52-48 for Hillary. So and- something's happening right now in Europe. It's happening in England. And uh, I think that's a good sign for 2020 if I was uh, one certain President Trump I would right think now. so. And, if for, and for folks who may not, uh, may not be familiar with your expertise on England in particular, that's where you grew up, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I was born and raised there for, yeah. uh, I mean, my childhood. But um, yeah. yeah, still got family and friends there. We are talking with podcaster and and broadcaster extraordinaire Dave Sussman, and we'll have a few more questions for Dave in a little bit. Also, we'll be exploring Dave's personal opinions on various topics coming up. (laughs) Easy listening music. Soft hits of the 80s there. <laughs> All right, let me talk. Anything. Yeah. Anything Lennon and McCartney up <laughs> Let me talk to you about a place uh, where you don't have to worry about whether or not the things you enjoy as a consumer of thoughtful commentary are being filtered through some tedious, mind-numbed autocrat who is stuck on politically correct autocorrect. Now, I'll give you a minute while we both try to figure out what I just said. Uh, What it all boils down to, boys and girls, is that finding a place where you can enjoy excellent podcasting and superb commentary, well, I'd respectfully suggest that you can do that right here on the Ricochet Audio Network, from former Education Secretary Bill Bennett's podcast to, well, Whiskey Politics podcast, and there's the Ricochet Flagship podcast with Peter Robinson, Rob Long, and James Wilex. The little radio deplorable here, you are likely, indeed, you are guaranteed to find something that will catch your interest intrigue your imagination, or make you giggle and blow your favorite beverage out your nose if you listen to this stuff for too long. But, you know, if you want to listen to this and you want to contribute to the website that makes it all possible, uh, well, you know you're never going to write a full-blown essay to begin with, but what can you do? Well, for starters, you can pay just $2.50, which is the cost of, um, I don't even know what costs two fifty dollars anymore. I mean, you, don't, you can't get a bag of M&Ms at the theater for less than a car payment. But anyway, for a mere pittance, you will not only be able to hear all the podcasts your little ears can handle, but you can comment on those podcasts as well. And this is the really cool part. You can read the remarkable essays and columns that our members write over behind the paywall in the member-only area, which is really cool. So all you got to do is just head on over to ricochet.com slash join, and you can learn more about this remarkable opportunity to be part of the most civil, smartest, the most compelling conversation on the Internet today. Just go to ricochet.com slash join. You'll be guts to check it out. It's radio deplorable. With Dave Somebody Dave shut up. Shut up! up. 
We're having a good time talking with my friend and a superb broadcaster in his own right, Dave Sussman. Uh, Dave, before we move to a, a blitz of questions on various topics, uh, after all that easy listening music, um, I got a question about your interviews, many of which center on the continuing encroachments of the progressive movement on free speech, national sovereignty, with respect to our borders, on education, racial issues, etc. Is there a common sentiment among your guests uh, on the well on the on the seriousness of the encroachments of the progressive movement in these areas? In other words, we often hear that liberals are entertaining until they attain power, and then the totalitarian claws come out. Do your guests give the impression that we on the right are fighting a losing cause with respect to those ideas? Is it, we're about to watch liberty itself be suffocated, or is it still winnable? You know, I think it depends upon the day and the week. Um, there is absolutely no doubt that the leftists march through the institutions that have uh, been our, uh, essentially taking over our media and our academia and our corporations for the past 70 years is yeah. now really starting to uh, hit a fever pitch. Um, we're seeing it in every aspect of every part of our lives now. And it's it's deeply concerning because the way that um, – uh, the way that our media is now so split up, we all go into our little echo chambers. Mm -hmm. But if for, for, for folks right of center folks, those echo chambers are few and far between nowadays. We have great sites like Ricochet. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people will point to Fox News, although I think that's definitely going a lot more uh, left than people are comfortable with. Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk about the the, the kids, the uh, uh, Lachlan uh, Murdoch and 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 his wife is is you know pushing that direction. Yeah. But the, the the question is, it comes down to culture. Um, you know, the oft repeated quote from Andrew Breitbart, right? Culture is downstream. Right. Politics is yeah. downstream from culture. Um, are they winning the cultural war? And when you take a look at where most people get their sources of news and information today, um, I would say, yeah, we are deeply, deeply behind the eight ball. Um, if you watch the late night quote unquote comedians, and I say quote unquote because I don't find them There's nothing funny. funny there anymore. OK, if I wanted a, if I wanted a sermon on democratic policies or how horrible this president is. I will just turn on a, a Colbert on 1130 at night. Turn on the CBS evening so, news if you want. Yeah. And, and, and so – and even the news. Right. Even the news today, the top two or three stories are exactly the same no matter which channel you go to. And they're all using exactly the same languaging. There are countless examples mm -hmm. of a news cycle where they all say exactly the same thing. Yeah. The throwaway tagline is almost identical. And the reason is, is because a lot of them get their talking points from each other, from leftists on social media, the blue checkmark journalists that create mm -hmm. and bubble up the news of the day. Um, I, you know, I, I, I guest host for um, Real Side Radio. It's a three hour nightly radio show. And we're going to have you on soon. I look forward to it. And, Thank uh, you. and uh, one, of the, one of the things that uh, we, we talked about um, a, a recent situation that occurred was that um, uh, we had um, uh, the when you talk about Colbert and you talk about uh, Jimmy Fallon and you talk about um, uh, you talk about the comedians, quote, unquote, and what they're coming out and saying with we had John Gabriel, chief editor in chief at Ricochet, come on the show and we talked about the power that the news media is now giving a, probably a couple 300 journalists mm -hmm. that essentially from the early morning hours to 3 p.m. every day, they percolate the stories. And w you and I will watch the news that night or we'll read something online and it will say a controversial issue – it was controversial because five idiots in the basement complained about it or said they were offended about it on Twitter. Yeah. But those journalists, those 300 journalists, took it on Twitter and then turned it into a news item. That is now the news. And so if we're, if we're now getting our news from uh, essentially a handful of people relative to, to the population – Mm -hmm. What are we listening to? What are we hearing? And then don't start me on the tech titans mm -hmm. and how you and I and many of our friends have been throttled 
What is the difference between throttling and shadow banning and just being kicked off of Twitter? Throttling is where they lower your ability to have exposure, to have people find you. We had a, a, a lady by the name of Mindy Robinson. She's an actress. She's a phenomenal lady. She's actually coming out in a movie called Roe v. Wade uh, this summer. And uh, she's got millions and millions of, of folks following her on Facebook and uh, Twitter. And she does these analytics that show you how many views you get. And from one day to the next, she went from about six, seven million views down to 30,000, 40,000, 50,000. Golly. How does that happen? How does that happen? Well, she's a conservative woman. Yeah. yeah. And she has people flagging her because they're offended by some of the things that she says. So you're now fighting the journalists. You're now fighting the academics and, and, the, and, and the schools that are indoctrinating our kids. You're fighting the tech titans that are really underpinning now a lot of how we learn about our news and our information. 70% of people get their news from some form of social media. Even if you're not on Facebook or Twitter, the information that you're getting that, that stems up to CBS Evening News is now coming from social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you fight that, Dave? Mm, well, you do what we're doing, but I mean, gosh, it's, it's an uphill struggle the whole way. I mean, humor helps. People like David Diebel and you know, lampoon people. That humor, I think, is one of the best weapons out there. But how do you get the word out? I see where you, I see where your point is. It's an uphill struggle the whole way. It's like Cincinnati. It's it, it it's exactly that, and also it prevents us who are free market, free minds, free thinkers. I want the debate. I don't want right. to shut down anybody. Right. I don't like Alex Jones. But I, 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 I don't want to listen to him, so I turn him off. Mm -hmm. I don't want him banned. It's like I don't want Louis Farrakhan to lose his account. Let him show what an anti-Semite or an idiot he is. But I don't want him banned. They want us banned. Right, that's the difference. And so that's the, that's the huge difference. And, and then the second part of all of this, because, I mean, you really it's, – it's, it's an issue that could probably take two or three hours to talk about – is that it is directly having an impact on our ability to get our voice out. And I'm talking about money. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the platforms, the platforms that you and I are on, the platforms outside of Ricochet and other platforms. They are struggling, and it is really, really hard. Mm -hmm. We put in a lot of our time and our effort, and we do things practically for free in many cases yes. mm -hmm. to, 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 to do what we believe is going to help our culture and have some impact. But uh, there's no money there, and conservatives don't dig in their pockets. And as you get an immer immerser or somebody or somebody that's going to, you know, a Daily Wire or somebody right. that's doing very, very well, but they're the tip of the iceberg. But for every Daily Wire, there's 100,000 folks like us that are out there that are really finding it very, very tough to continue keeping the lights on. And the money isn't coming in. And so there's a reason for that, and that's because the throttling and the viewership is not where it needs to be for people to invest, and it's chicken and egg. And so unless you've got a, a Joe Rogan audience with a million views, yeah. you're not going to get on those platforms. Well, how do you get to a million views when you're being throttled on Twitter right. or on Facebook? Right. I don't have the answer to that. I wish I did. Just don't know. We just, I, I, from my little perspective down here, I just keep doing what I do. Um, that's something I'd, be, I'd welcome some feedback on from the folks listening to us, see what kind of ideas they have. But don't worry, folks, because Netflix is going to be OK. We got mm -hmm. Hillary and her daughter, Chelsea, are now forming a production company to pursue film and television projects. That's on top of the Obamas and uh, Susan Rice having a seat on Netflix. So it's all good, folks. Don't worry. There's, there's no show. There's, there's nothing to watch here. No, nothing to see here. No slant to the culture at all. Uh, Bill O'Reilly used to call what I'm about to do the lightning round, I believe. I'll just tick off some subjects and then ask you to give me the gospel according to Sussman. All right. <laughs> you might be sorry no, no it'll be fun uh, let's start with border security what do you think and i may be framing this in an incorrect way you may be like Duke gingrich and reject my premise but what do you think has been the biggest obstacle of this point on i board, love that on borders? i'm sorry i don't mean to interject i stood up and applauded oh i know he did that. Uh, absolutely just reject absolutely. your premise right uh do you, do you think what was that, that 2012 right that was 2012. Yeah, he did really yeah, well for yeah. a while, and then uh, yeah, it didn't, it didn't work <laughs> out. But 
Um, so what, what do you think has been the, the biggest obstacle with respect to border security? Has it been Republican reluctance when they controlled Congress and the White House for two years or a judiciary with, with a superiority complex that insists on thwarting the president at every turn? Yes. Okay. <laughs> and, and I agree. I agree because I, I kind of, I kind of, well, it didn't really bait you, but I mean, it's up to Congress to define yeah. the, uh, the the jurisdiction. Listen, of the I was a huge so. advocate for Paul Ryan when Romney chose him as VP. I stood up and applauded. I thought Paul Ryan was going to be phenomenal. And yeah. then as a Speaker of the House, he went along to get along. And I get it. You got to, you got to find a way. OK, to bridge the divide. I understand that. And there are certain things that you need to do to sit down and say, OK, one for you, one for us. OK, they didn't do the two biggest things with a Republican House that should have done it uh, that ran in 2010, 2014, 2016, right, 20, right. 2016. Why didn't they push um, immigration reform? Why didn't they push repealing Obamacare? The two biggest things. So, so when, I'm furious. When they talk about it now, particularly out of the House, I, my, I, the set goes off. My, I tune it out because they had time to do these things and chose not to. So, And now they're running on it again. Well, of course I think they Trump do. Two weeks ago said, you know, uh, we're, 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 we're going uh, we're gonna to start this again in 2020 when we win back the House. Well, you won the House three times in a row based upon or four times in a row based upon those yeah, issues. Right. Come on. Uh, next topic. <laughs> how aggressive? <laughs> uh, let's see. How how aggressively do you think uh, do you think uh, the Attorney General should be in getting to the bottom of the erroneous Russian collusion story and the Obama administration's weaponization of the instrumentalities of the state to go after the political uh, opposition? Uh, you, wait, there was no Russian collusion. Oh well, yeah, that was just in. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, as far as I what? know, there there was none. Yeah, it, you have not been watching the right news networks or the right late night minute. talk shows. Were well, right? you telling me the last two and a half, three years was for naught? Well, it, there, no, to the extent there was collusion, it was on the part of the Democrats trying to get things uh, done through the Russians anyway. But that goes back to, God, to, uh, here's, to Teddy here's Kennedy, doesn't it? To you. Thank God for Bill Barr. This guy yeah, is the yeah. new sheriff in town, and holy cow. Uh, you know, the, the, a month ago when he sat there and he said, yeah, I believe they were spying. <laughs> you could see the heads exploding. Right. So they are doubling down right now. Mueller came out and he gave his his little uh, I don't know what that was. Right. <laughs> when he came out and, and he made his statements and just, uh, you know, the, the, the Democrats took the ball and ran with it. They tried to find all of the things that they could run with it. And now they're justified to to push for impeachment. Um, but uh, listen. There, you've got Huber, you've got all of these guys. They, what, what Barr is about to come out with, and I'm hearing this from sources that are d deep inside the swamp. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I'm hoping that they trickle it out. I don't want it to be all one big amount of. Uh, you know, just throwing up on everybody's lap sure. of how bad the Democrats were because yeah. it will be one, two, three news cycles and then we're moving on. I want this to be a drip, drip, drip mm -hmm. campaign. Mm -hmm. And if Trump was smart, and I think he is politically smart, okay, I think that this will carry on through the election next year. Uh, so I, I think that uh, the Democrats are acting with, you know, behind Nadler and Schiff right now. Uh, you know, it's it, talking about Rodney Dangerfield. They're pulling the collar back. Yeah. Right. Right. They're, right. they're, they're, they're really sweating right now <laughs> because they know that Barr and the investigation have now got the goods that these guys pushed this false narrative, got this fake FISA, uh, mm -hmm. do, do, you know, uh, approval based upon Yahoo News. And and and, and they turned it into. What a lot of people in this country still today will go to their grave believing right. was absolutely false. So uh, thank God for 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 Barr. I right. think it's 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 a good time. Uh, I think this uh, I, I think this should be a drip 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 though. Good. I'd like it to be. Okay, I agree. Um, next topic. Any sense in your mind, or on the part of on behalf of anyone's mind that you're privy to? on which way the public may be leaning as we approach the presidential election 
season. I know we're talking about Brexit a moment ago and how the public may search for a new elite and have done so with respect to Trump. Do you think that trend will continue? So I'm a big uh, proponent of not believing polls. Mm -hmm. I think 2016 is proof enough. Um, I think, and it isn't just U.S. polls. I think it's polls everywhere. We just saw shocks across the world, Australia, England, France. Um, and, and the reason is, is, is because technology's changed, as we all know. I don't pick up the phone. You probably don't pick up the phone right. unless I know who it is now. Yeah. Any, yeah. any identified numbers go into the – so uh, – but here's a really interesting thing, and I mentioned this to you just as we, we started up here. Um, there was a professor – and he was referred to a lot during the last election. Um, and he's an American university professor. And uh, his name's Alan Lichtman. And he has correctly predicted the last nine presidential elections. Okay. So you may remember this guy. Yeah, and yeah. he is no fan of this president. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's an American university professor. Take a guess. Right. All right. He is saying – this is an article that just came out in The Hill, which is – pretty center mm -hmm. uh, publication that President Trump will win 2020 unless congressional Democrats grow a spine, meaning they impeach. Now, I don't know what that means, what that caveat means, because I think that there is a lot of viewpoints on both sides of the equation that will tell you that if 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 they impeach, it will be bad for the Democrats, just like it was bad for the Republicans in 1998. Yeah, easily and then you speak yeah. to, I, I don't know. But as it stands right now, Alan Lickman, who's nine for nine, is calling Donald Trump re-election 2020. Wow. Nine for nine. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, and this is a, last is a personal question, but um, I, do I remember right? Uh, it, uh, for you personally, you had a rough time during the California fires. Yeah. Your, your home was under yeah. threat at some point. How did all that work out? Uh, it took about six months for them to remediate my home. Uh, they had to take out all the stuffing in the walls, you know, the insulation. Oh, and, and, uh, I didn't realize the extent uh, of it. They cleaned it. Yeah, the, the flames came within 20 feet of my front door. Um, so when I um, – I was actually interviewing – who was it? Uh, Katie Hopkins from England. Mm -hmm. okay. And I was down in Los Angeles. I don't live in L.A. Uh, I was down in Los Angeles. It was the night after the uh, borderline shooting which is which is around the corner from where mm -hmm. I live. And uh, so it was a very, very late night yeah. because I was up listening to all of that. And then I went down uh, to L.A. to meet Katie Hopkins. We did a show. And in the last segment of my show, um, my son, my youngest son calls and uh, um, I picked up the phone. Um, probably not a good thing to do in a, during an interview, but that's why I'm not <laughs> paid millions of dollars in CBS. <laughs> uh, it's my son, yeah. you know, and yeah, I right. said, we, we were actually in a break and I said, what's going on? He says, dad, your, your house, your house, it's on fire. It's on TV. It's on fire. So Whoa. I, I told Katie and, um, she said, Oh dear, you must go. You must go. And I said, no, it's probably the only time I'll have you. You live in England. We'll finish it up. And I poker faced it through the last 12 minute segment. Wow. And, uh, it took me two hours to get home because the freeway was closed literally at my exit. People were mm. driving like Starsky and Hutch to, sure. to, to do back, you know, to get to my house. Um, I was, about a block and a half away from my home and they closed the street down. It's my home was is down in a canyon. And think of a U-shaped hills going around mm -hmm. th this mm -hmm. canyon that I live in. Th those entire U of hills were on fire. Oh, and wow. there's a couple of uh, yards. There's an RV storage yard across from my development. Uh, and, and they were all on fire. And so it, was, it wasn't smoke. It was black smoke. It was toxic smoke. Mm -hmm. So he says, sorry, there's no cars allowed. I said, can I run in? I just need to get my stuff. My, and he says, yeah, you can walk in, but th they won't save you. So I ran in chugging down this the lungs of smoke. Mm -hmm. It's about a quarter of a mile. And I ran. I got to my house. The power's out. Everything's wet. Uh, smoke detectors are screaming sure. in all of my bedrooms, yeah. in, in, all of the, in all of the rooms. I ran up, went to my safe, got my passport, found my laptop in my office, and packed like two or three days of clothes and got the heck out of Dodge. But as, and, and, and you know our good friend Melissa Premonitis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's been on your show. And she produces uh, whiskey politics. Yeah. Um, she what, she lives in Michigan, but as her friend, she loves free parking, and I allow her to keep her car in front of my house. <laughs> oh no! She has this beautiful little 
Mustang. Yeah. She calls it Mustang Sally, a burgundy. <laughs> she sends me a text while I'm driving home with a picture, an aerial view of my house with her car in front going, my car! <laughs> it was at Michigan Television never on mind, the news showing the, the California wildfires. <laughs> and so I, I, I picked up my keys, or her keys, yeah. and I drove her car out of there, wow. probably saving it. And uh, went back to the park where my other car, my car was parked, and it was the there were spot fires in the park, yeah. and uh, I didn't expect to see my home again. Somehow they 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 kept. I mean, my firefighters, man, these guys are the heroes. Oh, yeah. They they kept the flames yeah. away uh, from going in. But yeah, it took about a solid six months of cleaning and remediation, and uh, they went in and and they just they had to keep coming in and doing all sorts of fun fun things. But uh, we're very very lucky. Well, thank God you were okay and everything. Are- Turns out all right. Yeah, and I had I had uh, about a dozen local friends who lost their homes. Oh my god! So uh, everything, you know, you start everything over again in life. Lord have mercy. The problem in California is it takes five years to rebuild. That's not surprising. That's not that's not surprising at all. Last question, sir, and it's real easy. I hope. Have you had a good time here today? I have a great time. <laughs> this is awesome. You're, you're just uh, – I we need more Dave Carter. On behalf of Ricochet, <laughs> find a way. Even if you can do like 2 a.m. interviews with Diebel who's in Greenland or somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we, we, it's, it's great and we'd love, love for you to do more and um, you are a voice that is sorely needed for the center right uh, – of those uh, who who like listening to good podcasts, so thank I, you for what you do. I Dave. really appreciate that, I, and uh, I'll have the check on the way as we talked about earlier. So it, <laughs> it'll, it'll, it'll all it'll all work. Well, and I've, and I've had a blast. It's always a treat and honor to have you here. So thank you very much. Also, I was going to ask where people can find you, but I know they'll be able to find you in Las Vegas, July seventeenth through the twentieth. Is that correct at Freedom Fest? Yeah, yeah, Freedom Fest. That's a uh, that's one of the uh, conventions that we like to do. Um, and, uh, that's, that, that is one of my favorites. Everybody knows CPAC. Um, but, uh, Freedom Fest is really different because it's more libertarian leaning yeah. and you actually have some left of center folks that are there, but, uh, uh it's one of my favorites. It's got amazing speakers. Speaking of Alan Dershowitz, he's going to be there. You've got Candace Owens. You have fun individuals like, um, What's his name? Uh, Kevin O'Leary from Shark Tank or right. Ken Gillette from, you know, Penn and Teller. Yeah, Candace um, Owens is going to be there. Yeah. So it's yeah. Be great. And uh, you've got you've got, you know, uh, fun folks that that everybody uh, uh, ricochet loves like Kevin Williamson or Rich Lowry. Yeah. And uh, and so I'll be speaking. Uh, it's an honor for me to be there again and speak. I'll also be um, working with America's Voice News and I'll be uh, doing uh, production for them and interviewing a lot of folks for their Good. television show. Good. where We have a show every week as well. That's going to be July 17th through the 20th in Las Vegas at Paris Resort, I believe. So it's freedomfest.com. If you want to learn more yeah. about it, check it out. And if you can find your way to make it out there, Man, I'd, I'd love, love to, to sit down and, and have to. a glass of something I'd with sell you. Sell some watches while I'm there, maybe. Uh, so uh, uh, where, where else can folks find you on the web? Uh, our new platform we got coming out in a week. Uh, it's called maven.io, M-A-V-E-N.io. It's not a political site. It is everything site. Uh, you can find stuff on sports, on news, on politics, Very left cool. and right. And uh, we are growing our platform on there. America's Voice News is a television channel that you can find on Roku, on uh, Apple TV, on uh, all of the platforms uh, like us cord cutters. That's what we use to watch television now. Mm -hmm. So download America's Voice News and uh, you'll find my show every night at 6 p.m. East Coast time on America's Voice News. And of course, with you at the good folks at ricochet.com. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, by the way. Find uh, Whiskey Politics on YouTube. Hit the subscribe button. Hit yes. the subscribe button on YouTube. You, Fight the uh, throttling. You and uh, Facebook not, and Twitter, You will course. not be disappointed. It's excellent, excellent programming. And if you want to find little old me, well, you can well, – you're you have, obviously. You're here. But uh, you can also go to ricochet.com. You can right here on Radio Deplorable as well and on the main feed where I post occasional columns. And, of course, my own little site, uh, davecarteronline.com. You'll find a collection of essays, podcasts, and even some, even some – uh, Stream of something or other musings I do on a page over there called the Inkwell. So uh, check that out. And as always, uh, Dave, thank you very much, sir. 
It's, it's been, Dave, it's, thanks it's, for having it's, me on. It's, we it's will be having you on soon. I, I need to arrange that with you uh, for the radio show as well. Good. And uh, love to uh, get your feedback on things because you, sir, are a radio maven yourself. Uh, well, okay, that's two checks. Thank you so much. They're both on the way. And with thanks to my guest. Take them uh, out to my ex-wife, please. <laughs> Cut out the middle, <laughs> you know, as someone who just finished that uh, little deal myself, uh, yeah, okay. Anyway, moving right along uh, with a guest, with special thanks to my guest, Dave Sussman, and very special thanks to you, the listener. Lord help me. I'm Dave Carter for Radio Deplorable on Ricochet. Well, I know you'd say I'm stupid. It just wouldn't be.